Hello everyone, my name is Hugo Cornelis and in the next hour or so I am going to take you on a journey where we're going to investigate some of the internals within SQL Server that we were probably not supposed to see using tools that were not really intended for that specific purpose. Welcome to Debugging Without Debugger, Investigating SQL Server's Internal Structures. My name is Hugo Cornelis and I make SQLServerFast.com. SQLServerFast.com is the website where I am building the execution plan reference. The execution plan reference is a full set of documentation for everything related to execution plans. Because, you see, execution plans are great. Execution plans can always help you understand why a query is running slow when you expect it to go fast. Execution plans can help you understand what you need to change to make that query go faster. Execution plans give a wealth of information about how a query was executed. But what we are missing is a wealth of information about execution plans. So that's what I'm trying to provide in the execution plan reference. As a reference, it is not really a good place to learn about execution plans. For that, I am recording the SQL Server Fast Execution Plan video training, a huge selection of uh, extensive videos where I teach viewers everything about execution plans. And whatever your level is now, you will learn a lot by watching those videos. So if you're interested in learning more about execution plans, go check it out. I also have other content on SQLServerFast.com, like my blog, where I regularly write about usually execution plans, sometimes other stuff as well. I have longer articles there. And I have a section called Resources, where I have the slide deck and the demo code for the session you're about to see and for many other sessions. Just go to SQLServerFast.com, then click Other, Presentations, Presentation Resources in the menu. Select one of the many presentations and download the slide deck and the demo code so you can play with it and do your own experiments and check the stuff that you wanted me to do but that I didn't. I do other stuff in the community. I do stuff for money. You don't really care about that. What you do care about is how to contact me because it is possible after watching this video that you have questions. This is not a live delivery where you can raise your hand and I will... Ask, uh, ask you what your question is and answer it. I would do that if this were a live delivery, but this is a recording. So if you have questions, just mail me, tweet me, and I will try to answer you as soon as possible. If you mail me and you don't get a reply within a week, send me your next mail. It's probably swamped between all the other stuff I get. I'm not deliberately ignoring you. I'm just sloppy. With that out of the way, Welcome to the session. We are going to investigate the internals of an operator called Windows Pool. And before we do that, let's look at what the, what the Windows Pool does. So what the Windows Pool does, it's an operator in execution plans that reads rows, stores them internally in a work table, and then the parent operator can receive multiple copies of those rows. Now that is not unique to Windows Pool. In fact, all spool operators do that. Table spool, index pool do the same thing as Windows pool, but Windows pool has some specific uh, functionality within it to make it work for the windowing functions, the so-called overclass. You know what? Let's just jump into a demo and see it in action. <coughs> so I'm going to go to the demo window and I will enable the live query statistics, the live execution plan and execute the query. And while it's running, I'll talk you through the execution plan, but first the query. So the query simply reads row from the reads data from the sales or the detail table. This is one of the tables in the AdventureWorks sample database that uh, Microsoft makes available. You can just download it from Microsoft. And we just return some of the columns. And then we have one column, which is the maximum carrier tracking number based on a window. This window is defined as the 10,000 preceding and the three following rows. So it's a total of 10,004 rows, but the current row is there as well. And preceding and following is based on an order by specification. So if you order the data on sales order ID, sales order detail ID, and then take the 10,000 preceding and the three following rows, you have the window of rows that each current row looks at to determine the maximum carrier tracking number. So this is not the maximum of the entire set, it's the maximum for each row for its window of rows. 
for those who don't know the over clause, you can specify a partition by clause as well, in which case it means for each partition you basically reset and you only look at the window in that specific partition. I didn't do that for this demo. Now, if you look at the execution plan, and I will start at the far right, execution plans can be read in multiple ways. In this case, I choose to follow the data, and following the data means start at the right. So I start at the far right, where you find the clustered index scan, and I hover it for the properties, and I will zoom in a bit, and then you will see that the ordered property is set to true. This means that the optimizer forces the uh, operator to return rows in the order in which they are logically defined by that index. And I happen to know that this index called PK sales order detail, ID, well, long name, it's the primary key of the sales order detail table. I happen to know that if you read this order, you always get the data ordered by sales order ID, sales order detail ID. And it's no coincidence that it is this order. Whoops, that was the wrong key. It was, it's no coincidence that it's this order because the reason is by ordering the data this way, we can easily identify those windows because the rows are already in the proper order. SQL Server has to have the rows in this order for, for to e even enable this windowing functionality. In this case, it can do this by reading from a clustered index scan with orders. If that had not been possible, if I had chosen to order by something where there is no supporting index, SQL Server would have had to use a sort operator. Now, apart from the performance uh, consideration, which usually is that you prefer not to have a sort, in this specific case, I am trying to investigate stuff in TempDB. I want to look into the internals in TempDB, and the less messy clutter I have in TempDB, the better. A sort can spill to TempDB, so a sort can allocate stuff in TempDB, which is exactly the messy clutter I try to avoid. So that's why I deliberately used a sample where no sort is needed because there is an index that can be read. Now, after reading data from that index, the data goes through a segment operator. And the segment operator is used to mark logical segments. Normally, if there were a partition by clause, this would mark a new segment for the start of each partition so that other operators in the execution plan know, hey, we have a new partition here. In this case, there is no partition by. So why is the segment column there? Well, it's there. And I'll also show you that it's helps to call it correctly, the group by which defines the segment boundary is empty. So the segment defines the entire data set as one single segment, as, which makes sense because there is no partitioning. So everything is one partition, one segment. So why is the segment column even there? Well, it's just technical. The next operator, sequence project, requires a segment uh, uh, column in its input. So it needs to have a segment column, even if it's logically not really needed. So it's just technical. The sequence project then adds an extra column to the data, and this extra column is a row number, as you see here. So this simply adds one extra column that order the numbers, the rows, one to, well, the total number of rows is 121,317. It will just count them and give each of them a consecutive number. This number is needed later, for instance, in the compute scalar here, and the compute scalar adds two more computed columns. <coughs> One of them is called top row number and is computed as the row number minus 10,000. That looks like 10,000 preceding. And let's remove the marks. The second is defined as the, it's called bottom row number and is defined as row number plus three. That is the three following. So now we start to see already how this all interacts. We see that the data is read in the correct order, then the rows are numbered, so they are each given a unique number, and then based on that number, we compute the row number of the first row in the window and the last row in the window. Then there is another segment column, and this segment column is in the plan for the same reason as the previous one. And why don't we simply reuse the previous segment column? Well, because Windows Pool just requires a segment column as its direct input. Segment columns are incredibly cheap, so it makes no sense for the optimizer team to do all kinds of optimizations to prevent the double segment column when those optimizations cost more than the 
extremely low overhead of that segment operator. So it's just this way. Technically, the operator would not be needed, but it's there. Now, the window spool operator, if you look at the row count, you see that it is producing insane amounts of rows. And that's because how window spool works. What window spool does is all the rows it gets from its child, from this segment operator, are stored in this work table. And then for each row, the window spool operator will return that specific row. And then this entire window of 10,000 proceeding up to three following rows. So the window spool returns 10,005 rows for each input row. That's why the number of input rows is 121,000. The number of output rows is in the millions. What window spool returns, if you look at the uh, output list, is a lot of data that you expect, and then also a column called a window count 1010. And that's simply a number that goes up every time a new row plus a window is output. So it outputs a current row plus the window that belongs to it with a number. Then it outputs the next row plus the window that belongs with that next row with a new number. That enables the stream aggregate to then, whoops, to then group by that number and reduce this entire set of rows back to one. So what's the use of having one row, exploding it into 10,005 rows and then aggregating it back to one? Well, the use is that now this stream aggregate can look, and I need to go to the defined values for that, <coughs> can look at that window of 10,005 rows to determine the maximum carrier tracking number that we want to return for this over expression we have here. For all other columns, it uses the any operator, which simply uses the value from the first row, because here we tell the operator, just use any of them, and it happens to be the first one. That's how any works. So that's how all this works. We have some preparation steps to make sure that the rows have a number and that we know the number of the first and the last row in the window. Then the window spool stores it in a temporary work table, returns those rows multiple times so that each row gets its entire window of rows with it, and stream aggregate can then do the aggregation so that it determines the correct max track uh, maximum of the carrier tracking number. Let's start investigating, because we were not here to talk about window spool. We were here to talk about investigating SQL Server's internal structures. So I want to know this work table, how is it stored exactly? And if you start by doing some internet searching, you will find very little information. What you will find is that if, based on the text in the query, the number of rows can never exceed 10,000, so that's based on the numbers in between so many preceding and so many following, if that is the case, then Windows Spool will store its work table in memory. If it can be more than 10,000, it will store its rows on disk. And I want to investigate the on-disk version. That's why I used a window between 10,000 preceding and three following. That's a window of 10,004 rows, current row is included, which means it's more than 10,000 and it will be stored on disk. Now, when I want to investigate a work table, I need to overcome some problems. First of all, queries don't run as long as I want to. Queries run in a finite time. And at one point they finish. And if there are, is a structure used internally as a work object by that query, SQL Server will of course not keep it allocated. As soon as that query is done, SQL Server realizes, I don't need this structure anymore, and I'm going to release it and my investigation will hit a dead end and I need to restart the query and restart the investigation. Now, how much time do I need to investigate this? I mean, this is a one hour video, but of course I spent a lot of time figuring things out and I'm only showing you the end result. I sp had a lot of dead ends. I needed much more time than one hour and I didn't know in advance how much time I need. So no matter how long I like make the query run, it can always be too short. If I let the query run for six hours, uh, turns out I need seven, then the structures are gone before I'm uh, done. And the problem is the next time the query runs, I need to find the structures again. So of course you can use the debugger to halt the process. You can just start the query, make sure that the temporary the work table is allocated and then 
use the debugger, hold the process. But problem is, the debugger is an incredibly complex tool. Some people can work with it, I'm not. I'm not smart enough to use the debugger. Also, when there is something stored in TempDB in a work table, due to how SQL Server works, it can be on in memory only in the buffer pool, or it can be flushed from the buffer pool to physical disk, or it might be in both. And they might even be different if the page is dirty. And if the SQL Server process is halted, I need to figure that out all by myself. So I need to figure out where in the buffer pool is the page stored, where on disk is the page stored, which version is correct. That's hard. If SQL Server's process is running, I can use the statement dbcc page. It's not a documented statement, but it's a quite well-known statement. It's often used for purposes like this. And that uh, statement will make SQL Server itself figure out where the data for that page is stored and just show me the data. Much easier. But that means the debugger is off the table. Now, I can create a very slow query, as I already said. We'll make the query run for six hours. But then if I need seven hours, structures are gone before I'm done. And if I then restart the query, because they are internal structures, there's no idea, guarantee that they will be allocated in the same place. They might be allocated somewhere else, so I have to restart my search. That's a waste of time. So I don't want to do that either. What I do instead is use documented stuff, supported stuff. SQL Server supports concurrent use. There can be multiple users. SQL Server has a process called locking to say, hey, this row is protected, you shouldn't touch it, and if you want to touch that row, you are blocked. You need to wait until the lock is released. Wait until the lock is released, that sounds like exactly what I need because I can determine how long I keep the lock. So I can make you wait as long as I need. That's exactly the solution I need. And bonus, it's completely supported. I'm not doing any weird stuff. I'm using supported statements only. So let's jump in the demo and see how this works. <coughs> now what I have here is first as a comment the original statement. The reason I have it here is because we need the results. I already executed the statement. I have the results here. I'm not going to change this window. I'm not going to run anything anymore here. I already have the results, so I don't need it anymore. Then I have a bunch of code in the next commented section, and I'm going to copy that and then open a new window, and I'm going to paste it there. What this uh, code does is I'm going to create a table called block windows pool because this table is used to block the progress in the windows pool operator. This table has four columns, and these four columns correspond exactly to the four columns in the output here. I checked the AdventureWorks schema, I checked the data types of all the columns, I checked the uniqueness rules, just to make sure that I know that these are the correct data types and I can store the output in those columns. And I also know that the output will be unique on the combination sales order ID, sales order detail ID, and that's important because I need a primary key, or at least a unique index, to uh, uh, do what I want to do. Now. I want to determine where I want the uh, execution to stop because I want the execution to run for a while and then after we exceed the 10,000 rows, let's make sure that we have a full window. So I want to be past the first 10,000 rows and let's say I want to go to, uh, that's a bit too far, go back a bit. This scrolling always takes a little while but we're there. Let's say I want to stop at this row. So we have sales already 46,359 and sales order detail ID 10,000, 10,001. I think that's the one I have in my code. No, it's 10,000, 10,000. Sorry, I mean this. So we're going to stop at this row. So I take these two values. I don't care about the other values. I care about the values that are in this primary key. So I use those two values here. And because I start a transaction, then add data to a table and then this is commented out. I don't roll back or commit the transaction. I leave the transaction open. So at this point, we have a running transaction. It's not completed yet. That has data stored in this block window spool. Now I'm going to first check the execution plan that is used for this statement. So let's make sure that we're in the correct database. Execute. Now I'm going to select this statement. 
I'm going to check the execution plan only. The reason I do that is because adding the insert can affect the execution plan. Sometimes SQL Server realizes, oh, if I do another execution plan, so I get the rows in another order, then I have better uh, performance. I want this execution plan to produce the rows in the same order. I want full control. I want to know for sure that when this row is uh, produced, it is in fact row number 10,100 and not the rows are not produced in an order, this, uh, order because I want to have this full control. So what I did was I checked not only the graphical execution plan, I checked all the properties of all the operators to make sure that there's zero difference. I will not do that now on camera. It's, it's a lot of time, it's boring, but it's needed. In this case, the execution plan is the same. So even though I won't see the results, they are inserted into a table, so I can't see them. I know I can trust that the results will be produced in the same order as when I did see the results. So let's run this query and see what happens. The query just starts running normal. There are no results because they're now inserted. There's a clustered index insert. It's the only addition uh, compared to the original execution plan we had. But as rows are being uh, processed and inserted, you will uh, soon see that now the counters stop. Yes, the timing counters still run, but the row counters have all stopped. And you will see that the Windows, the segment has returned 10,105 rows. That's a bit more than we expected, but that's because of the three following, the Windows pool operator has to read ahead. You cannot return row number 10,100 without also having seen rows 10,101, 10,102, etc. The stream aggregate has just returned row number 10,100. Clustered index insert tries to insert row number 10,100, but it can't. It has inserted 10,099 rows. It tries to insert row number 10,100, but because I have this row inserted in an uncommitted transaction, that value is blocked. And the operation is not allowed to insert. And this will continue as long as I want to, until I say, okay, you know what, let's just roll back this transaction. And now this uh, 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 process is running again. I don't need it right now, so I'm going to stop it. But now we have figured out a way to block the query for as long as I need it, for as long as I want. I can just leave it open for days if I want to. No problem. Okay, I can't reset my computer. I can't use it for other things, but I can. Now that we have the query frozen, that we have all the time in the world, it's time to find the objects. So where do I find this work table? Well, what will not work is just type select star from, because from what? How, what is the name of this work table? Sure, let's move back in the demo. And I ran this original query with statistics IO on. That means that I get information here about tables used. And as you see, I used a table called work table. But here's the thing, this is not the name, this is just a token. For sales order detail, this is actually the name. But for work table, it's a symbolic name. The table isn't named work table. And if you type select star from work table, you will get an error because there is no object named work table. It doesn't exist. So that doesn't work. Okay. Something else then, perhaps. Um, use DMVs like, like sys.indexes or sys.sysindexes. The best way to find stuff, if you don't know the name, but you want to see what is added to sys.indexes, the best way to do that is to have two query windows open, one before and one after, and then we can compare the results. The uh, uh, Yeah, we can compare the results of the two. Uh, let's try that. So I have a query here, and I'm going to copy it entirely and create a copy in a new window. And I'm going to run this query already. So this is the uh, sys.indexes, sys.sysindexes, when the window spool is not running. This has been stopped. So the window spool has deallocated its structures. There is no work table now. Now I'm going to set up my block again to give myself as much time as needed. Start the window spool again. And now at this point, a work table, not at this point, I had something highlighted, but at this point, a work table should be allocated for the window spool. So here, I'm not going to touch this, hands off, 
this is the image of sys.indexes uh, and sys.sysindexes before executing the Windows pool. Now with the Windows pool there, I'm going to look at sysindexes and sys.sysindexes again. And I could control tab between the two windows to compare differences, but let's first look at something else. Let's first look at the total number of rows returned. So now with Windows pool running, it's 380 for the two result sets combined. Before I started the Windows pool, it was this window, it was also 380. So the result sets have not grown. I have allocated something in TempDB, but it's not in sys.indexes nor in sys.sysindexes. Well, okay, that makes sense. It's an internal object. Why should it be exposed in sys.indexes and sys.sysindexes? Okay, perhaps it was. it was. It was worth a try, but there is no real need for SQL Server to expose this. So, yeah, this is a failed attempt, but it was worth a try. You know what? What I also can do is, instead of looking at sysindexes and sys.sysindexes, which are DMVs, I can look at the underlying system tables. Those, those are normally protected from view. You cannot simply in, uh, query them, but they have information much closer to the engine, more raw information. So I can compare them by looking at the number of rows returned in the execution plan. I'll show that in the demo. You could also uh, use DBCC page, for instance. The, uh, or you can use the dedicated. Uh, I can't pronounce words anymore. Um, you can also use the dedicated administrator connection, but the, there's only one dedicated admin connection. So then you can use a control tab tr trick to alternate between the two windows and you have to do more work. So what I did instead was look at execution plans to see how many rows are returned from each underlying actual system table. And then if needed, you can use DBCC page to check the actual data in those uh, tables. So let's look at whether this is a good approach. And I or, uh, deliberately executed these two queries with the execution plan enabled. So this was the window with the copy is the one I executed before starting the Windows pool. <coughs> and this one is the one I executed after starting the Windows pool. So even though sysindexes and sys.sysindexes show the same number of rows, in the execution plans you can look at all the underlying system tables and I'll save you some time and tell you the uh, most important data where the actual indexes are stored is this clustered index scan on sysidx stats. Um, that was the wrong click, my apologies. And if you look, you will see that the number of rows is 166, but the number of rows read, that's the number of rows actually in the system table, is 214. So there were rows in the sysidx stats system table that are not returned. See, SQL Server is hiding some internal tables from us. They're not for us, intended for us, but they are stored anyway. And they're hidden based on this predicate, which looks incredibly hexadecimal and not very illegible to us, but it does confirm that there is more stored in sysidx stats than we see in sys.indexes. 214 rows after the Windows pool started. And before the Windows pool started, there were also 214 rows. And yes, when I investigate this, I did more work. I actually did go through to DBCC page to look at the actual data within sysidx stats to make extra sure that I wasn't overlooking something. But the reality is, this entire work table used by the Windows pool is simply not stored in the DMVs nor in the system tables. And again, it makes sense. There's only one location within SQL Server that needs to know the details of this work table, and that is this Windows pool operator. And that Windows pool operator can store that data in its work memory. It doesn't need to store it in DMVs. So nothing about that work table is stored. Let's stop this and we'll return to it later, but let's first make sure that everything is clean again. So now I've seen what doesn't work. However, there's one thing that I should be, you should be aware of. SQL Server supports concurrency. 
even if nobody except the Windows pool itself uses the pages allocated to that work table, Microsoft still wants to make sure that while the Windows pool is running, other sessions that also do work in TempDB don't use the same page. So that's where it gets interesting, because even though the information about the work table is never stored anywhere, one thing does get stored, and that is, this page is mine, keep your hands off it, because it's mine, it's reserved. One of the places that is used for that is the PFS page, the page free space page. And if you have a database file of, I believe it's up to eight gigabytes, I don't know the exact number, then there is one PFS page. If you have larger database files, or if you have a database with multiple files, then you have multiple PFS pages. I like to keep my life easy, and that's why for this specific research, as shown in the prepare script, I have created a separate instance that I'm using only to test here, and I have created a temp to be with just one single file. For performance, that's a bad idea. That's not how I normally configure my instances. But now it helps me because it's a single file, it's small, so I know that there's just one PFS page. And it's, I will know that if anything changes in which pages are free and which are not, it will be visible in that single PFS page. I don't have to go hunt for other PFS pages. I've also switched off parallelism to make sure that all the rows are always returned in the same order and you don't have multiple threads returning rows. And because then I could block one thread, but other threads would continue to run and that would make my life a lot harder again. So that's why I also disabled parallelism. Um, let's clear out some stuff while I'm in the demo anyway. And then I'll return to the demo later once we checked what we're going to do. So I'm going to look at the PFS page and I'm going to use the same trick with two windows and control tab between them to see the differences. As soon as I find a page that was free and then later gets allocated, that is a page that is probably allocated to the work table in the windows pool. At that point, I'm going to check the header of that page to do some double checking and then use a DMO called DMOS buffer descriptors to quickly find all other pages of that object. An alternative way would have been to check all the pages that were first not allocated and then allocated later or to use the previous page and next page pointers, but this is the quicker way, so that's what I used. And once I found all the pages allocated to the temporary table used by the spool, I can use DBCC page to inspect their contents. And that's the strategy I will use to find and inspect the object. Let's look at this in the demo again. Now, one more thing I'm going to do before running this demo is I'm going to restart the instance. And the reason I do that is because there is some optimization going on in SQL Server TempDB specifically, because SQL Server knows that TempDB constantly uses space, releases it again, uses it again, releases it again. So if some pages were allocated and then are free, it doesn't immediately give them back. It keeps a, some pages allocated because it knows it's probably going to need it again. So after running a few experiments, TempDB will simply reuse pages it already has instead of allocating pages that were free. To quickly find pages that were actually allocated, I need to start with a clean TempDB. At this point, nothing has been allocated in TempDB yet, and I can actually start looking. So let's look, take some code. And this is code that looks at page one in file, sorry, page one in file one of the TempDB. The three is the output style. Three is a rather readable output style. It formats the output in a way that is easier to parse than the other alternatives. So its official name is dump style. I can run this, and if I look at the output, I see some interesting stuff about the page header. And then below that, a list of all the pages where that were allocated or not allocated, and some information about how they are allocated. Now, if I use the same code in this window and I execute it here as well, I obviously get the exact same results because we did nothing in TempDB. Both are 
are executed immediately after each other without doing anything. But now we're going to do something in TempDB. So I'm going to set up the block again. We have a row that is blocking the window spool. I'm going to execute the window spool again. And now I'm going to wait for a bit, because at this time stuff is moving in TimTP. Data is being allocated, data is being read, data might even be released. I don't know exactly what window spool is doing, but it's doing stuff, and it's doing stuff in TimTP. So if I look now, it will change from one millisecond to the next. Instead of doing that, I will wait until, as you see now on the screen, all the movement has stopped at this point, all this query does is wait for clustered index insert to say, hey, I managed to insert a row and you can give me the next row. But clustered index insert will not tell us that because I have this block that I'm not going to release. Now I'm going in this window to refresh the data and look at how the PFS page looks now. So this is the window that shows the PFS page after window spool was started. This is where you see the PFS page before the window spool was started. And I can control tab between the two. And if you look at the output results, you see no difference. And if I page down, you see again, no difference. And if you page down again, you see a difference in the page allocation status, but that's not really intended for human use. And I'm not going to look at it. What I'm interested in is the long list of page allocations below it. Now, sometimes when I experiment with this, there is a difference in the has ghost or has no ghost. This time it seems to be not the case because I don't see that difference. Oops, I scrolled the wrong window. Let's make sure they are the same pages again. No difference. At one point you see, and here we see it. Now I see a place where I'm looking at the same set of pages, but there is a difference when I control tab. So here is what we had before we started the window spool. Page 125 is allocated. 126 and 127 are both not allocated. Then I started the window spool, and now 125 and 126 are both allocated. 127 still isn't. So the difference is in page 126. This is one page, and if I scroll further, there will be more, but I have an easier way to find them. But I now know that at least page 126 was allocated when I started the window spool. That doesn't make it 100% sure that it is for the window spool, but it makes it very likely. So I'm plopping 126 in the DBCC page to check the uh, contents. And I'm using dump style one because I'm at this point only looking at the page header. And what I want to see in the page header is first the object ID. The object ID is normally a positive number that corresponds to some one or, or an object in the sys.objects table. Here it's a negative number, and that only happens for internal objects that are not official, officially documented in the object table. So here we have a confirmation that this page belongs to something that is an internal object and not a normal table. That means that it still might be our work table. I'm still not 100% sure, but I'm getting more and more convinced. So I'm looking at the allocation unit ID now, and we're going to copy that into... The, uh, 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 control C and then Control V to paste it here. And now I can run this query to find all the pages that have the same allocation unit. This is the fastest way, there are other ways, but this is the fastest way to find all pages that have the same allocation unit with their page type and some other information. And I see an index page, an IM page, and a lot of data pages. And if I scroll down, you will see that the rest is all data pages. As one of my experiments, I've done the same after letting the window spool run for a much longer time, after process, having the process 100,000 pages. At that point, there were way more pages here. So that shows that all the data read is stored in this work table. It doesn't release data that's not needed anymore. Technically, it only needs the last 10,000 rows, but it can store up to 100,000 rows or more if you use a larger set. At that point, you also get multiple index pages because this data is effectively a B tree. Good, we have a B tree. There's more confirmation of that later. I'm not going to point it out, but I had a lot of things confirm that this is a B tree. This is a relatively small B tree with just one index page, which is the root and a bunch of data pages. If I have more data, there will be more index pages. The root page is at page 369. So I'm going to copy that, paste it here, and check the data on this page. And 
for the record, the reason I use dump style one here is because I have to. Normally, when I check data pages, I use the dump style three. If I do that here, I get some header information, and then if I scroll down, I get an error message. Dump style three is not possible. That's because this page is allocated to an internal object that is not documented in the sys.indexes table, uh, tables. DBCC page uses sys.indexes for the formatting for dump style three. So if that information is not available, dump style three doesn't work. That's why I have to use dump style one. Dump style one does mean that the data will be harder to read. This is all we get, hexadecimal data. And you have to know exactly what all this means. Well, the good news is I know what all this means. I have read this book by Karen, uh, Kellen Delaney. It's the SQL Server 2005 version. I probably should buy a new version one of these days. But her description of how the rows are stored on pages is still accurate even on SQL Server 2019. So I use the information in that book to help me understand the data that is here. And one of the things that I noticed, that I happen to know, is these two bytes here are a, a, a pointer to a file. Now, TempDB in my sample database only has one file, so obviously that has to be the number one. These numbers are always read in a right to left version byte by byte. So you read it as 0, 0, 0, 1, and that is the number one. The four bytes before that are therefore read as 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 7, 0. Hexadecimal 170. Now I'm going to bring up a calculator, put it to hexadecimal mode, and 170 is decimal 368. So what I see here is that in this index row, there is a pointer. We have data on a page number, what was the number again? 368. Now double check, run this query again. 368 is indeed a page that's also allocated to this object. So I didn't make an error, probably. Let's look at that page, 368. And again, I need to use dump style 1. Dump style 3 here doesn't give an error. It simply gives nothing, even though there is data there, which is even more confusing than an error. Dump style 1 shows me all the data that is there. And this is one of the many pages in the work table, and this is one of the rows. And when I first saw this, I got very excited. And I'll tell you why. I got excited when I saw 4911-403C-98. Why this, does this information make me excited? Because I had looked at the results of the query before, and when I go to the first row in the results and then look at its carrier tracking number, that's 4911-403C-98. That's the same data we see here, 4911-403C-98. We have here the carrier tracking number of the first row in our data set. So now I know for sure that I have found data that belongs to this work table. I have found the work table I was looking for. I was not supposed to find this. SQL Server tries to make it hard for me, but I managed to get there. That made me very happy. But it was not yet the end of my journey. So let's return to the presentation and look at what I did next. So I now have found an index page, in this case one. If I let the query run longer, there will be more. I found lots of data pages, and on those data pages I have found the data that is stored for the work table. But how exactly? What is the structure? How is this data stored? Well, before diving into all that hexadecimal garbage, let's think about what we expect. So I returned to the execution plan, and I looked at the segment operator that feeds data to the Windows spool, and I asked, looked at its output list property. The output list property tells us what data do we expect to find, sorry. The output list property tells us what columns are returned from this segment operator, to the Windows spool operator, and that's this list of seven uh, columns. I also looked at the Windows spool operator at its output list property to see which columns the Windows spool returns to its parent, the stream aggregate. And when you compare those two lists, you see that the sales order ID, sales order detail ID, character tracking number, and row number are in both. 
So it makes sense that those are all stored in the work table. Logic. I mean, they get in, they get out, they are stored somewhere. That's what the work table is for. Same, uh, same for segment 1009. That's also a column that's passed into and returned from the Windows pool. So it makes sense that it is stored. Top row number and bottom row number are presented by segments to Windows pool, but are not returned. But based on how Windows pool works, I would expect those in the work table as well. Window count 1010 is produced by the Windows pool as it returns rows. And based on how it works, I personally did not expect this column to be in the work table. So my expectation is the seven columns, sales order ID, sales order detail ID, camera tracking number, row number, top row number, bottom row number, and segment. Of course, that's an expectation. I can be wrong, but it helps to know what we are looking for to find either a confirmation or, okay, we found something else and then we need to figure out why my expectation was wrong. It, it does give me something to look out for because now I know what data I'm looking for. And then I started reading data. Like I said, inside Microsoft SQL Server 2005, the storage engine written, uh, written by Kaelin Delaney, or any of our other books or other books, there is lots of documentation about how to read DBCC page output. This is not something you do on a daily basis. It's probably something you never do on your normal work. But if you are investigating internals, information like that helps. So I started with the index page. And here you see a screenshot of one of the earlier times I did this, <coughs> it was a different run at a different time, data was found on different pages and on the index rows that means that you find different data there because index rows have pointers to other pages and if those other pages are allocated at a different location then those pointers change. So these are not the same values you just saw uh, in the demo but it's another time I ran the same queries. So the first byte in an index uh, row is always a status byte. And the value 0, 6, you can just look it up in the, uh, in the documentation, means this is an index row and there is no null bitmap. DBCC page also tells us that because it says here it's an index record and there is no null bitmap. But even if that were not, uh, you can now verify that indeed the 0, 6 ma uh, matches. And as I also already said, I... In the index page, you find at this specific location the pointer to the file number and the page number where a row is where a, a page is stored. And that page is the page that starts with, well, not this value. In a B3 index, on every index level, on the first page in that level, on the first row, the index key is unused. And when SQL Server doesn't use data, it doesn't bother to initialize it. So whatever garbage was in that location on disk or in memory when this page was allocated is left unchanged. The bytes are reserved because it's a fixed length data, uh, fixed length field, but there's nothing there. It's just whatever garbage is there. This value is never used because it's the first entry on the first page of a level. If you go to the next index row, here the status byte is 1.6, meaning it's an index row with a null bitmap. And again, DBC page tells us that index record, null bitmap. And here you see also a pointer to, in this case, file number one, page number 282. And we have an actual value here saying that on page 282, the first row will have the index value 113 decimal. 7, seven one hexadecimal. Also, because there is a, a null bitmap, we find the number of columns as two bytes at the end and the null bitmap itself. Well, there's one column here is not null and we already know that because the value is 113. Then finally, for the last, for the third row on this screenshot, we have something similar. The, we have page 283 starting with index key 225. And I checked some of those pages and they did indeed start with those values. So it's all still a very normal B3 index. Let's now look at the data page. The data page is much more interesting because that's where the data is stored. Well, the index page was interesting as well because it keeps confirming me that this work table is created as a normal B3 index. It's not using specific structures for work tables only. 
it's using a B3 to store data. But the data stored is also interesting. So here we have a screenshot of some of the data on such a page. The same one we saw in the demo, the first page. Because it's a data row, we have two status bytes. And the two status bytes, uh, 3000, zero, 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 that encodes it's a data row. There is a null bitmap. And there is at least one variable length column. Cool, we know that now. Then the next two bytes is the position where the number of columns is stored. And that position is further in the row because the way SQL Server stores data on page is that after the status bytes and the position of the number of columns, com first comes all the fixed length data. So we're going to skip some bytes that are the fixed length data and go to the place where the number of columns is stored. Hexadecimal 25 happens to be this location. And the value here is 0008. So we have eight columns in total in this row. After that, we have the null bitmap. The null bitmap is one or more bytes, depending on the number of columns. If there is one to eight columns, the null bitmap will be one byte. If there is nine to 16 columns, the null bitmap will be two bytes, etc. Here we have eight columns total, so the null bitmap is one byte. After that, come two bytes that represent the number of variable length columns. So in this case, we now know that this row stores eight columns. Two of them are variable length, which means six of them are fixed length. Those two variable length columns each have their end location encoded. So the first variable length column ends just before byte number hexadecimal 2e in this row. And the second variable length column ends just before byte number hexadecimal 46. I counted the bytes and the first variable length column ends immediately after the, so just before that 3, 4, and that means that it's a zero length column. Yes, variable length columns can be zero length. Obviously, if it's zero length, then the content is empty and it's a bit harder to understand the data that's there. So at least for this row, the variable length column is very hard to decode because it's empty. I can look at other rows later, but let's first check this row further. So I'm going to skip this first row. You know what, let's move my head around a bit because I'm in the way of my slides. So I'm now on the other side of the slide deck. And now you can see that the first variable length column, I, I put question marks in there because I don't know yet what is there. I'm going to skip that. The second variable length column ends at the end of the entire uh, uh, row. And we already saw in the ASCII representation on the right of this data that this is the carrier tracking number, an N varchar column, which is where there's two bytes for each character. So we found the carrier tracking number. We found an, a second variable length column that we don't understand yet, and we know that there are six fixed length columns. Let's look at those first. Now, the fixed length portion starts with eight bytes. That's if you read them in the correct uh, order, a bunch of zeros and at the end a one. Zero, 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 blah, 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 one. That's hexadecimal, but in decimal it's also the value one. And I was expecting a column for the row number, and the first row obviously has row number one. It's eight bytes, which is a big int. That means that I found that this is the row number stored as a big int, and for row number one it's the value one. Now, then I cheated a bit. Instead of trying to understand what 8BAA was, I did something else. Uh, I went to the data. So let's go to the data. And I expect at least this value 43659 is stored. So I copy this value into a calculator, decimal. And then I say, what is the hexadecimal version? It's AA8B. Well, if you know that you're looking for AA8B, then it's quite simple to understand that these four bytes are the integer AA8B. So that's how I found that this should be the sales order ID. Cool. Then after that, it's four more bytes for the sales order detail ID. And I knew that the value was one in that integer as well, so that was also easy to find. And then I ran into a real head scratcher because after that, if you look at the screen, you see the value 05F1D8. And I looked at it and it didn't make sense. 
And I looked at it a bit more and it still didn't make sense. And I, I ran into a wall there. So what I then did was I know that there's six columns total in the fixed length portion. I know the starting point. I also know the ending point. So let's work backwards from the end of the fixed data. At the end of the fixed data, there's eight bytes there that are very easily recognized as the number four. And because I already checked the execution plan, I know that there's a bottom row number column that's computed as row number plus three. Well, that's four. So these are the eight bytes that store the bottom row number. And once you are there, you realize that just before that sixth column, so in the fifth column, there's a lot of Fs. And in the hexadecimal representation of an integer, if there's a lot of Fs, it's a negative number. Well, surprise, we needed a negative number. Because we also have the column called top row number, which is computed as row number minus 10,000. For row number one, that's minus 9,999. I use my calculator, minus 9999 in hexadecimal using uh, um, the normal notation with uh, uh, one reverse, uh, I forget the name, but using the normal encoding of integers in hexadecimal minus 999 is represented as a bunch of Fs and then D8F1. And that's exactly what I found in this row. So now I have found that it made sense that I didn't understand 05F1D8 because it's just a part of two, uh, one column plus another column. And the only missing column is one single byte. And that single byte is the only thing that's still giving me a headache. And on the first row, you see the value is 05. And on the second row, you see the value is FE. And it's hard to relate that to the data. I didn't, I was unable to make sense of it. So I ran a bunch of experiments and I stopped for the day and I restarted the next day. And I, at one point I realized something. There's something weird with that weird, mysterious single byte column. And that is, if I run the same code multiple times, it's not always the same data. Now for an index page, that makes sense. For an index page, the data can be different because index pages point to other pages and data is not always allocated in the same location. And if it's allocated somewhere else, then the pointer needs to change. For data pages, I don't expect the data to ever change and yet this byte changed. And then I noticed something else. The first row always has an odd number. No matter how it changes, it's always odd. All other rows in the work table that I looked at and of course, I didn't look at all 121,000, but I looked at a lot of them, and all of them had an even number except in that first row. And then I realized this is not a byte I'm looking at. Yes, it takes a byte, but I'm actually looking at eight bits. Seven of them are unused. Remember what I told you about what SQL Server does with locations that are unused? Nothing. It just leaves whatever garbage is there. So those seven bits can be different between runs because they're not initialized. It's just whatever is there. Only that eighth bit is controlled. And that's for the segment column. That is always one on the first row, which is why it's always an odd number on the first row and always even on the rest. So now I figured out that fourth byte is simply seven unused bits and one bit used for the segment column. That's seven of the eight columns down only thing left was this variable length column. And I will admit, I probably would not have figured this out if I had only looked at window spool. But before looking at window spool, I had already investigated table spool and index spool. And there is an interesting uh, similarity between all of them. They all use clustered indexes. They all use B trees and they all define that B tree as a non-unique clustered index. Now, in a non-unique clustered index, you always have something called a uniquifier. So once I noticed, when I went through all the pages, run after run, comparing data after data, and that column was always zero length on every row, on every page, wherever I looked, it was always zero length. It was always there and it never had any data. Once I realized that and I saw the similarity with table spool and index spool, I realized this B tree is the B tree of a clustered index, not a non-clustered index. And the clustered index is declared as not unique, 
when you declare an index, a clustered index as not unique, then SQL Server will define a hidden column called the uniqueifier. And the first time it sees a value, that uniqueifier remains empty. It's a zero length column. If you then insert the same value a second time, you have a duplicate, which is allowed in a non-unique index. But for a clustered index, there still needs to be some uniquity. And that's why the unique fire column is then used to add an extra four byte ascending integer to make the rows unique. Now, in this case, I had a clustered index defined on the row number. Due to how the execution plan works, there will never be duplicates there. So the index didn't need to be defined as a non-unique clustered index. It could have been defined as a unique clustered index. Then this column wouldn't have been there. But for whatever reason, the way the product is built, the Windows pool defines its work table as a non-unique clustered index. And that's why we get this always empty column in the rows. It's there. It's always empty. It's always zero length. But it's there because a clustered index needs it if it is defined as non-unique. And with that, I have finished the last problem to overcome, reading and interpreting the data. I've managed to do that. Give me a second while I move to my favorite corner. And then I'll talk you through the conclusions. So what I have seen is if a Windows pool uses an on-disk work table, that work table will be defined as a clustered index, defined as non-unique on the row number that on the in a column that contains the row number which is a unique number, but it's still declared as non-unique. My confirmation was, conf my suspicion was confirmed that indeed all the input columns are stored in that work table. But the output column window count that is generated by the Windows pool is not. And that's all I have. If you have questions, please mail me or tweet me. I will try to answer them. If you want to learn more about execution plans, go to my website, check the reference if you have specific things you want to know, check out the training videos if you want to learn more. And also, if you want to learn, see more of my videos, comment, like, subscribe. I think that's what all the cool kids say when they're on YouTube. Thanks for watching. This was Debugging without debugger, investigating SQL Server internal structures. My name is Hugo Cornelis. Bye-bye.